Okay, welcome. Got it. Um, I'm Corinne with the Fair Housing Project, and you are joining us for our. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm like a little distracted with my Facebook Live button. Um, you are joining us for our second Fair Housing Friday of the month. Um, we are. Uh, we have a great set of panelists. I'm going to let Nate introduce in just a second here. Um, but I do want to let you all know that you're joining us um, for the Fair Housing Friday. Um, that is a part of our a series that we're doing for Fair Housing Month. Um, we do have over 30 people registered for this event. So uh, you'll notice that we uh, invited you into this room muted and we ask that you do stay muted um, until the Q&A portion of this webinar. And then we also do try and leave a good amount of time at the end for your questions. So um, as we listen to our guest panelists, be thinking about um, if there are any questions or things that you would like to hear more about, and feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and, and, and I'll be moderating the or helping moderate the Q&A as well. Um, and just to give an uh, overview of fair housing, since it is Fair Housing Month, and we want to make sure that you all walk away with a, a at least a, a small understanding of what fair housing is. Um, the Fair Housing Project is um, a project of, of Champlain Valley of economic opportunity. Uh, we are part of the housing advocacy team, uh, which includes the mobile home program, which uh, Nate, our facilitator, is representing, uh, and Vermont tenants, uh, most popularly known for our Vermont tenant hotline, but also for our uh, free Vermont tenants education. Um, so lots, lots of information there. I will be putting um, a link to uh, our programs in the chat. Um, and then each year, each April, we recognize the 1968 passing of the Fair Housing Act, uh, which put into uh, law essential protections, uh, making it illegal to discriminate in rental, sale, or financing of housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, family status, and disability. Um, each state has the opportunity to expand on those protections. And here in Vermont, uh, we have uh, based on our community's needs. So in Vermont, uh, age is also protected as well as marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, receipt of public assistance, denial of development, based on uh, development permitting based on in income of pr prospective residents. Sorry, that one's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, victims of sexual abuse, stalking, um, or sexual assault. Um, and I think I covered them, all the our state protections. I will say that we do a quite extensive uh, fair housing workshop that, um, and we also include our fair housing education in our Vermont tenants workshops as well. So there's always opportunities to dig uh, deeper there. But what this means is that it's against the law for you to be treated unfairly based on your membership of any of the federal or state protected classes. Um, and just to say quickly, uh, discrimination is not always obvious and can take um, very many forms. It can happen when the landlord um, refuses to rent to you uh, an apartment the most kind of telltale sign, but also maybe um, when they say it's an uh, apartment's unavailable when it's vacant, or when they set terms and conditions in your lease that's different than other tenants that they're renting to. Um, and, and again, we do um, cover a lot of this information in our Vermont Tenants Workshop. Um, at the end of this presentation, there will be lots of space for questions. Again, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. And I, I can't um, emphasize enough, we have a lot of other uh, free fair housing um, events happening throughout the month that are available in our events calendar. I'll also link to that in our chat. And at the end of um, this workshop, we will be sending um, a follow-up uh, blog post that will include this recording, as well as all the different resources we, we touch on today. 
And without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Nate so that you can go ahead and introduce our, our moderators. And I think I can switch the view so that it's on speaker view and we're not looking at so many empty boxes. Okay, take it away, Nate. All right. Thank you, Corinne. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight or today. It's not tonight. It's 1230. What time is it? Um, my name is Nate Lanteri, and I'm one of the resident organizers with the mobile home program at CVOEO. Um, and, and I'm really uh, excited to be joined by some great panelists today. Um, three folks that have a lot of different, um, a lot of knowledge about the mobile home landscape in Vermont, um, kind of coming from some different perspectives. Um, so I, I'll, I'll introduce them now and then, you know, I'll kind of go into a brief preamble of basically some of the places we may go in this conversation. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to save some time at the end for some questions. So um, keep them writing them down, add them to the chat at any point, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to them. So um, yeah, I'll start with introductions. So uh, we'll have myself as a moderator, Nate Lantieri with the Mobile Home Program. Um, we have Kelly Hamshaw, who is a senior lecturer with the Community Development and Applied Economics Department at the University of Vermont and one of my former professors. This is very cool. Um, we have Elise Shanbacker, who is the executive director of the Addison County Community Trust, um, who is the uh, owner of several mobile home parks in the Addison County area. Um, and we have Gail Pezzo, who is the uh, board president for the Westbury Homeowners Association, um, which is a cooperatively owned mobile home park in Colchester with approximately 250 households. Um, so, Really excited to be joined by, by all these fine folks. And um, we'll kind of get into the bulk of this and, and really, why are we all here? Why are mobile homes part of the affordable housing conversation in Vermont? Um, a lot of times folks may not even consider it to be an option when we're thinking about the future of affordable housing. Um, and, and we can kind of start out with what the conditions are on the ground right now. So in Vermont, there are 236 parks, mobile home parks throughout the state, ranging from three homes to 300 homes um, with a lot of different kind of characteristics and some that are very similar in between parks. Um, within those 236 parks, there are 7,000 households that are primarily gonna be homeowner occupied households um, where the owner of the home also rents the land from the park. In those parks, there are really three kinds of different ownership models. There's the standard, a private um, entity owns a park, kind of similar to a um, you know, tenant landlord relationship with some extra caveats. And then in the past 40 years, since 1989, there have been the options for um, housing provider nonprofits to purchase parks when they go for sale, as well as for residents to actually explore the concept of becoming resident owners of their park. Um, so in that time, there have been 68 parks that are now considered to be nonprofit owned or cooperatively owned, um, 18 of those being co-ops. So that's kind of the general, that is what, that's the number of mobile homes that exist in the state. Um, so why are they important? Well, as I kind of mentioned before, they're a really great opportunity for home ownership in Vermont. Um, you know, we hear time and time again, that the options for middle-income people to become homeowners in Vermont are dwindling faster and faster. Uh, mobile homes, you know, by some nature of them, they provide an on-ramp for folks to be able to um, go into homeownership when, um, you know, without needing to buy a multiple hundred thousand dollar home. Um, yeah, multiple hundred thousand dollar home. Um, additionally, with their uh, ownership status. Um, the rent that is required for mobile homes is significantly cheaper than pretty much any apartment that you can find in the state. Um, you know, the, the going rate for a one bedroom in Chittenden County might be $1,200 right now. The going rate for a mobile home rent per month, eh, even higher. Yeah, it's probably actually higher than $1,200. Um, in Chittenden County, the lot rent per month for a mobile home, which could be a three bedroom home, um, might be $400. So these are an essential piece of the affordable housing landscape, both in terms of renting and owning. Um, a lot of times, a big barrier in, in terms of how we continue to promote this is just the stigma, this, this old stigma of, 
you know, mobile home parks as some other, as some other place that, you know, they're not for people like us. Um, and then when re in reality, we find that these are very strong communities with um, people that are engaged, people that want to work with their neighbors, people that, you know, want to just live in an affordable way in Vermont. So um, that's kind of my introduction to this landscape um, with, with a lot of, you know, with any kind of specific housing type, there are some unique challenges, but also unique opportunities. Um, so, you know, some of the some of the potential areas we're going to go through this conversation are looking at some of the um, funding challenges for mobile home parks and looking at, you know, how they can receive uh, funds from the state and local governments. Um, infrastructure. A lot of these parks were built, you know, 60 years ago and the pipes have not been replaced and they weren't that good when they were put in in the first place. So, you know, a lot of these infrastructure systems are aging at the same time. How are we going to work with that? Um, we're going to look at some of that stigma that I was mentioning and, and how that impacts communities still to this day. Um, and specifically how there can be some, you know, both physical but also political distance in between, um, you know, decision makers in a town or in the state and, and residents in a mobile home park. Um, the other two pieces we're going to look at are some home repair challenges. As I was mentioning, a lot of these parks are older and a lot of the homes are older. And a lot of the folks that live in these homes are older and may not have the funds to get their home into a safe and healthy way. So, you know, that's going to be a challenge in looking at the long term sustainability of them. And then finally, looking at some of these longer term risks um, in 20 early 2010s, you know, a lot of the Vermont housing landscape was rocked by Hurricane Irene and mobile homes uh, in particular were. And we've looked at a lot of the impacts of flooding and the long-term sustainability of them in this, you know, post Irene error, era, error. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, what steps need to be taken so that these main, these communities stay, stay safe, stay healthy uh, and can avoid these natural disasters. So that's kind of where I'm going to start it out. Um, and why don't I pass it over to my panelists and who would be first alphabetically? I think that would be Elise. So Elise, why don't you uh, start us out, just kind of give, um, you know, a five, 10 minute introduction on kind of where you come into this perspective and, and kind of really anywhere you'd like to take it. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Nate. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about myself, a little bit about ACCT and um, give an overview of, of some of the major challenges that we are addressing right now in our mobile home parks. Um, so as Nate mentioned, I'm Elise Shanbacker. I'm the executive director of the Addison County Community Trust. I've been in this role since 2015, but I actually first got involved with ACCT back in 2006 when I was a student at Middlebury College and decided to write my thesis on social capital in mobile home parks um, and interviewed residents at Lindale Mobile Home Park in Middlebury, which is a 67 unit park. Um, and uh, and wrote wrote about uh, really how that community is um, first and foremost a neighborhood like any other neighborhood with um, really diverse people from diverse backgrounds. Some people who were living there for a very long time and loved the community and had really strong connections with their neighbors to people who um, were really just passing through. So that was that was sort of my big takeaway is really. You know, while while on the surface they may have some unique challenges and unique opportunities at their heart, they're really just like any other neighborhood. Um, so, uh, in terms of ACCT and our role now in the mobile home park landscape, we own nine mobile home parks, ranging from nine to seventy-three units, um, with a total of three hundred and forty home sites. About five of which are currently um, vacant and sort of unable to be turned over um, without major reinvestment in the infrastructure on the site. Um, infrastructure is the big challenge in our mobile home parks right now. Um, but uh, that said, uh, prior to, to this year, we've been focusing on infrastructure for a long time. Um, last year, we um, did make a lot of progress on the financial stability of the mobile home parks. Um, mobile home parks do not have access to a whole lot of subsidy. Um, I think it's great that we're a nonprofit and to have nonprofitly owned mobile home parks, but that doesn't mean that we have some funding source 
um, that can be put into the parks to make them more affordable necessarily. Um, we collect lot rent every month and that is the money that the park has available to pay for its expenses. Um, and because lot rents are relatively low, but uh, parks can have very costly um, infrastructure needs, that's, that's a big challenge with maintaining and operating mobile home parks. Um, that said, last year, we were able to access some uh, tax exempt financing through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, which was an amazing resource for us. Um, and, and refinancing the parks at least reduced the amount of that lot rent, the share of that lot rent every month that was having to go towards paying for the mortgage on the park, which means more money is available for maintenance. Um, so that was, that was a big milestone for us. Um, right now, we are working on addressing failing septic systems in Lindale, the park that I mentioned in Middlebury. We've gotten some major funding from USDA Rural Development, as well as the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, Community Development Block Grant, um, and some others in there. Uh, at the end of the day, it's going to cost over $2 million to put in a new septic system for these 67 residents. Um, you know, meanwhile, if you have the privilege of living in a neighborhood that is on town water and town sewer, um, you, you might pay a sewer bill that might be $1,000 a year or so. Um, in this case, we have a very costly septic system upgrade that can only be spread across, uh, across 67 end users, um, which in the case of Lindale have a median household income of $35,000 a year. So we're really trying to pursue as much grant funding as we can to reduce the impact on lot rent. Um, but the reality is some of that financing is going to include debt. Um, and that gets passed on to the residents. So dealing with these infrastructure challenges um, are, are definitely going to impact affordability, um, but at the same time are necessary to keep the parks um, sustainable as well as safe and healthy. Um, obviously having surfacing effluent in people's yards or septic systems that back up into washing machines is not um, an acceptable uh, standard of living. So, uh, you know, Lindale is just one project. We are embarking on planning for another um, community septic system. We hope if it's feasible even up in uh, Starksboro, we probably have three or four other parks that also need a wholesale redevelopment of their individual on-site septics, which as, you know, Nate mentioned, a lot of the infrastructure dates from when these parks were built in the 60s. So they have uh, cesspools and leaching tanks. I didn't even know what that was um, when we found the first one that we didn't know about uh, and, and all sorts of systems that you couldn't build today um, and are very hard to build. You know, the, these homes or these parks are located on sites where it's very difficult to build anything today. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to put the park there today. So that's a big constraint that we face. And then overall capacity. Um, we got We've gotten pretty far down the road on this project with Lindale and hope to, um, you know, bid, go out to bid soon and break ground this summer and get that system replaced this summer. Um, and uh, now are realizing that um, the electrical in the park, the electrical systems is also something that's going to be need to be addressed um, and conduit put in and another very expensive project. but. We worked with a civil engineer on the project and civil engineers cover a certain set of systems and electrical systems are a different set of, of engineers and a different scope. So to have uh, somebody who's a developer who can bring together all of those different pieces of the project and figure out, okay, this clean water fund can pay for the septic, but this VHCB money can pay for the electric, that's very challenging. And there aren't a lot of people in the state who even know how to or have the capacity to do that. And the last thing I'll say before I uh, leave it there for the next panelists is I'm also, I'm really excited to answer questions, but also really excited because I think our property manager, Chris Allette, is also in the audience on this call, and she is the property manager for all nine of those parks with all 340 units and um, knows so much more about the day-to-day -day of what's going on in our parks than I do, so hopefully she'll um, be able to, to chime in too. Yeah, thank you, Elise. And a lot of, you know, a lot of what you were talking about is, is so critical and, and especially in relation to the infrastructure. You know, we talk about, um, you know, a lot of times in Vermont, we're talking about clean water and, um, 
you know, these parks that again, they're home to 7,000 residents throughout the state, you know, people that are already living there. In a lot of ways, they didn't choose to not be, you know, hooked up to a municipal sewer system. It's just the virtue of where they live. Um, and these parks, when, when all of the revenue that they're generating is from lot rent, it's great that these rents are low and that it's an affordable option for people. But in the case that, you know, as you're mentioning, a $2 million septic system comes as an immediate emergent need and it's not accessible to state and local funding, that's a huge area, that's a huge issue. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll transition over to one of our other panelists and, and that's Gail Pezzo, the, the board president of Westbury Homeowners Association, the mobile home co-op in Colchester. And uh, Gail, yeah, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and share some of your perspective and you know what it's been like uh, you know, as the, the president over in Westbury these past few years. And you are muted. So my name is Gail Pezzo and I'm the board president at Westbury Homeowners Association. We have 250 units. We also have a building with a rental. We have 4.6 road miles and 183 acres. And I didn't know what I was signing up for when I got on this board. But my perspective is as a resident. I moved here um, in 2016, and I'd never lived in a mobile home uh, community before. I saw it as affordable living. I'm retired. I had just gotten divorced. The rent was, I'm from Long Island, so that was like, what are you kidding me? <laughs> you know. So my perspective is that as um, it kind of shifted once we became a co-op, because I moved in here, I was paying lot rent, Westbury, things were done. I mean, the previous owners, they did work. We didn't know then that a lot of it was Band-Aid or, you know, a little bit of spit and polish. But once we became a co-op, I began to realize that, um, so our lot rent is the only revenue that we have to fix these major sewer, leach field, electrical upgrades that the inspector said. Now, remember, we have 250 units, and he's being very kind that he's not saying this needs to be done in five years. The park just turned 50 years old. So my focus, I started to explore what options, thinking there's grants, Remember, I don't know anything. I'm not from Vermont and I never lived in a mobile home before. So it was kind of daunting to me that there wasn't any resources, really. There's a few grants. So I started to do some research about if our community could become a fire district. And I didn't really... I didn't spend a lot of time on that because I really felt like I was in the weeds. But then as talking to people outside the park, um, something came up about the possibility of us becoming a municipality, a village. And so becoming a village, a municipality, a subunit of the uh, Colchester, that would open more doors and then we might be able to use our lot rent more efficiently. And I'll use this as an example, and it's only an, as an example. So we pay fifty thousand for um, for winter maintenance for snow plowing, and that's the low bid. The other ones were seventy five and one sixty five. So if we took that fifty thousand and that went into the village pool, and we could partner with another municipality, of course, we would want it to be Colchester and them charge us a fee for service for the plowing. And like I said, this is an only an example. Then there's a possibility to use our lot rent more efficiently. So I've been really researching this part of the village part of it for about a year. And I finally went to the select board again, but on the village part of it last Tuesday. 
They didn't put us on the agenda. There may not have been time. Um, but now they've invited me to the agenda with the people that I brought, which CVOEO is, happens to be one of them, and CDI, and a, an attorney. And I can't make it when they say that they can put me on the agenda. So I answered their three questions. Hopefully, all we were asking them, we weren't really asking for their permission because you don't need permission from the town. We were asking if they would provide us a select board member or a staff member to work on the charter to as a collaboration. Um, I'm not sure if they don't understand the prospect or they're just kind of kicking, kicking the ball down the road. Either way, I'm in it this far. I might as well, you know, like three years in, you might as well like see it through. So at this point, um, that's where we're at. What we're trying to do is just find some, some opportunity where it isn't just lot re rent increases that help us to maintain our property. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Gail. And yeah, I, I, there's a lot of, you know, kind of important stuff in what you're just saying. And, you know, where my mind goes is, is two places in particular, and that one of them being so we, we've been talking about these resident owned communities in Vermont, and um, I think it would be good to kind of drill into what that actually means. So as of some legislation in 1989, um, mobile home parks, their residents have not exactly right of first refusal to explore the purchase of their park when it goes for sale, but they have some protections that allow them to explore that option. And from 1989 up until about 2011, very few co-ops were made because it's a really difficult process. It's, um, you know, to take a small handful of residents and expect them to understand the financing required to buy, you know, multiple million dollars worth of land and houses is a pretty daunting task. So in 2011, the Cooperative Development Institute, a really great nonprofit, um, came into Vermont and started to help communities with the process of dealing with the finance associated with becoming a co-op. So in that time, we went from, you know, a small number up to, I believe it's 18 as of this year. There were two that recently, you know, passed the conversion in Colchester also coincidentally. Um, but, you know, despite these great goals of being, a, a, you know, a more democratic way of, of having a community, there are still challenges that present themselves, including one of them being that once it becomes a co-op, the process of creating that finance is that they become a private for-profit institution. This is despite being set to be for community benefit, you know, it, it, it's democratically controlled. It's not for profit. The only revenue is going in from lot rent and out towards maintenance, but they are a private institution. And as such excluded from several of these state and local grants. Um, so big challenge. Yeah, go ahead. Elise. I just underscore Gail did a much more eloquent job than I did. Like I live in Virgins, right? I take for granted that the city has a water system operator and a sewer system operator and the guy who's in charge of plowing the roads and fixing the roads, right? And the cost of all those people is spread over um, 20, the 2,800 households that live in Virgins, right? But take Otter Creek Mobile Home Park down the road, actually take our whole portfolio of nine parks, 340 units, we still have to have the person who knows how to operate actually not just one public water system, but five public water systems, knows how to maintain mostly dirt roads, cut that $165,000 annual cost of plowing, um, and you know knows how to fix a how to what to do in the case of a failed septic system? We only get to spread that cost over 340 ratepayers. So I think that you can like just really see how big a challenge that is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I'll I'll add two more points on the on the co-op piece before we move over to Kelly. And um, one of them being that you know something that has been really enlightening for me in my conversations with Gail is that you know despite being connected to these private systems, every resident of all these mobile home parks pays the property taxes for the town that they're a part of. They pay the same rate of property taxes that any other homeowner would, um, 
but they get a lesser quality of service or just a lesser amount of service. You know, there isn't municipal power plowing or water or electric. Um, and instead, you know, they need to pay that on top of these things and, and often through their lot rent. Um, uh, and the only other piece being that with these infrastructure systems, you know, again, we go back to these were, were created at a time in the 50s, 60s, when there were different understandings of what a sustainable water system would be. Um, so we'll go into parks throughout the state and there may be 100 homes and 50 septic systems. Um, and every one of those septic systems is an opportunity for, you know, a potential issue to arise. So, you know, the fact that that is matched up with a lacking access to funding really just creates this, this really tough spot that communities are put in, um, both ones that are private or nonprofitly owned, as well as co-ops. And even in this too, when a, a park goes for sale um, and residents are exploring the potential purchase, they may know we have someone of like a ticking time bomb underground that within the next five years, yeah, our sale price is this, but it could be quadrupled in terms of the actual cost within five years, one year or 20 years. And we just don't know, you know, so often we just don't know. Um, and, and the state is starting to recognize this and is starting to use some ARPA funding to, to address this. But, um, you know, that, like we said, there's 230 parks and I would say less than a handful of them are, are municipally set up. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Kelly. Kelly brings some unique perspective, uh, you know, from being a researcher and someone that's been in this world, uh, you know, for I would say 10 years. Does 10 years sound right? Maybe a little. Oh, longer. gosh. Um, I go back to the days of the lease, actually, um, okay. just at the start of my graduate work in 2007. OK. Yeah. Cool. So, Kelly, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Nate. And I just want to acknowledge we've had a longstanding partnership. Um, so my mentor, Dan Baker, who's also one of Nate's former professors, and I um, have been working a long time um, from the UVM Center for, um, well, Center for Rural Studies and the Department of Community Development and Planet Economics um, with the mobile home program at CVOAO. And so we've we've shared multiple grants together. We've, um, with different um, past generations of resident organizers and directors, we've been on the ground in parks all over the state, um, whether um, you know doing kind of a community community survey to get a sense of what people really value about their uh, mobile homes and their park communities, um, to identifying some of the challenges um, with this form of housing, to being on the ground, um, you know, a few days even just after Tropical Storm Irene hit, and even with a park um, that was devastated in Berlin back in the Memorial Day flooding back in 2011. Um, so a variety of different contexts, um, and it's really been a pleasure to have such um, an amazing resource um, to be able to work alongside this amazing resource that's serving park residents um, across the state. Um, the other thing I just want to underscore before I talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've been um, looking at in partnership um, with all this, all these wonderful um, folks, um, it's just the tenacity I think it takes, um, and that we heard in Gail's story um, about um, seeing this transition um, to more resident-owned cooperatives. Um, one of my current undergraduate students, Lindsay Parrott, is actually on the call right now, and she's been um, interviewing mobile home park stakeholders um, this past year around trying to document this um, incredible uptick, right, in resident-owned cooperatives that we've seen um, since Bunker Hill um, back in 2011. Um, and, and the stories and the challenges and also the opportunities, right, for this form of um, really important rural housing stock um, in our state, not just our state, but elsewhere across the country as well. Um, so a few of the, um, I think, key themes from my work with mobile homes, I think one of the original um, projects that I worked on was actually working in the town of Starksburg, working with Elise's um, predecessor, Terry McKnight, um, and the town planning commission there to really get an understanding of what issues were happening in the park as the planning commission um, was making different decisions around um, zoning and setbacks and, um, and making recommendations, but also realizing that there really wasn't um, representation from park residents um, in those meetings um, and those voices weren't being heard. And so 
um, part of that work that we were able to do is um, brainstorm with the planning commission, brainstorm with Terry, and at least I, I believe you were in those meetings as well um, back in those days um, to really um, you know, design a survey where um, myself and a team of undergraduates were out in the parks um, talking with residents. Um, yes, filling out a survey form, but also just getting a real sense of um, what made life in these parks really special and also some of the challenging things um, and highlighting those um, to bring back to the town um, and also to bring back um, to ACCT leadership. And that really spurred the development with the support of the CVOO mobile home program um, resident organizers at the time, um, the formation of resident associations. Um, and those, um, some of those meetings that I remember really fondly from Brookside, um, from um, some of, almost like a cookout, um, I think we had um, really to share back some of the survey findings. Um, one of the most major survey findings that we found was people talking about how important it was to have their own four walls. That was a really a point of, of pride, um, a sense of security um, for folks to be able to have control over their own space. And yet also how much they enjoyed, um, many folks, not all folks, um, enjoyed their neighbors, right? And having a sense of community um, and, and being uh, having a strong um, sense of, um, a strong sense of place, while there really was also a disconnect um, with town leadership. Um, and so some of those challenges were simply, um, you know, not feeling um, that their voices would be heard um, in those um, municipal settings, um, that their communities felt um, disconnected from the rest of the community, um, that social stigma really being a, a, a real challenge um, that folks were feeling. And so um, part of those early meetings, um, not only kind of internally getting people um, to talk about their shared um, concerns, their shared um, experiences, um, also uh, making those connections back to the town um, and being able to um, literally bring the town to the park um, as well. And so that um, was some of our early work. From there, um, we had an opportunity um, to write a USDA uh, research grant um, to look at resilience in rural communities. And so in our work with mobile home parks, we would run into parks called Brookside, River Run, um, Riverside. Um, and so the idea came up um, to write a three-year um, research grant um, with a funded position at the mobile home program um, for some of the engagement work um, to be able to explore this notion of are mobile homes more, uh, more vulnerable um, to natural hazards like flooding, um, especially in um, with climate change impacts, um, you know, coming down well here actually. Um, but that was in 20 December of 2009 when we wrote that um, grant. And for those of you who are here in August of 2011, um, that timing felt very um, fateful. So we were um, scaling up at the time, um, if you were in the mobile home program office, there was a paper map up on the wall with thumbtacks literally to represent um, where all the parks were located. And so one of the first things we did was actually get a bunch of GIS to, um, data together and make a map um, where you could see all of, um, at the time, 245 parks um, across the state. Um, the next step we did while also, um, you know, supporting on the ground efforts with recovery um, in some um, parks, particularly in central Vermont. Um, we also, um, a partner on the project also looked at um, whatever available FEMA um, data we had um, to be able to look at floodplains in relation to where those parks are. Um, one of, our, I think, our, our key findings from that work is that indeed mobile homes within parks do face a higher risk of being located in a hazardous area for flooding. Um, so about 12% of mobile homes in parks um, are in a 500, 100 or a year floodplain or a floodway. Um, and then when we looked at single family homes that were site built, that number was only 4%. Um, and mobile home parks on private land were about 6% um, in, those, in those hazardous areas. So we were able at the same time grappling with um, the on the ground um, impacts of Irene, trying to support FEMA, um, advocating for um, greater inclusion of parks and recognition of parks um, within the emergency management um, community. Um, we were able to bring this data and these maps actually um, back to the table around the same time as co-ops were really um, gaining energy. And so um, a lot of that work we're actually revisiting right now to look back um, and say what's changed in the last 10 years um, in that landscape. Um, and that's been a really 
um, interesting and dynamic um, experience now going back. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, we did see some parks um, either close completely or convert um, into a different housing stock altogether. So one park, particularly in Waterbury, um, that was located just off the interstate, um, that was 11 units of mobile homes. Now are about $200,000, or at least when they were built, $200,000 um, site-built cottages, um, and you know, really out of reach um, for the folks who were living in that park the day before um, Irene. And so it, it really, um, to me, when I'm thinking about mobile home parks and the opportunities here, this is our largest unsubsidized affordable housing stock um, in our state. Um, and it's a really, it also has a lot of, um, gives folks, um, um, you know, literally their own four walls. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of good things with that. Um, and really respecting um, those choices um, and, um, and the benefits of that is something that I think we're always trying to advocate for while we're also holding at the same time the complicated challenges or the complexities of all the things that Elise and Gail have also mentioned regarding um, infrastructure and the need for greater investment. And so I think um, that's something that we're really trying to do here with our work is, is really um, amplify resident um, voices and experiences, support our partners on the ground, um, and also provide data that can help park owners like Elise and Gail, um, you know, make, um, you know, make decisions about um, where to, uh, where to invest in it and hopefully inform, you know, other decisions that come up down the road. So I think I'll pause there um, and we'll move on. Yeah, thank you all for, for sharing this perspective and, and your unique perspectives. Um, and I will, um, you know, make a plug for any folks who have questions, you can pop them in the chat or use the raise hand function on Zoom um, in order to do that. Um, and it looks like we have a question coming in from, from Anthony. And just before I get that, just so that I can actually read it, um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pose one question of my own and it's kind of based off of what Kelly was saying and that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the challenges so far and um, that's a lot of times the way we frame these conversations about the issues. But in, in my experience going into these parks, there is a lot of success and there is a lot of joy and there is a lot of community. Um, so I think it would be great, you know, if each of you could kind of talk about some of, some of the great opportunities that exist in the mobile home parks or some of the, the factors that really, you know, do kind of set set these communities apart. Um, so, would anybody like to take that up? You know, primarily, I, Kelly was kind of answering that in, in the home ownership piece, but um, yeah. I mean, I will just say so. Um, John from I don't know if anyone from Bunker Hill is on the call, but um, the experience of watching that part come together um, in the face of you know they had a nonprofit owner that. Um, was merging with another nonprofit. The park wasn't going to be um, transferred in that um, in that sense, and so the park residents were issued a, a closure notice. And their only option um, was um, to become a resident-owned cooperative. Um, I think, in, in addition to like their own individual homes, that sense of community within that park was so strong. Um, I remember going to um, the initial um, park meeting. Um, I think with um, Sean Gilpin and Sarah Woodward. Um, and there was um, a staff member from BHCB and Arthur Hamlin, and we were in this building um, in downtown Windsor, and somebody had a flip chart, and it was very clear that there was no other nonprofit park owner that was coming to the table. Um, it didn't seem like there were any private um, buyers interested in the park as well, and so they were facing a, a pretty stark, um, you know, bridge or fork, fork in the road. Um, and as soon as um, the potential for a co-op, which at that point had been probably about 20 years or so since the last park had formed uh, or transitioned to a resident-owned cooperative, um, they just set right to work with having us um, map out on a flip chart. And I, somewhere on my desk, it's very messy right now at this point in the semester, but there is like a, there's a picture of that flip chart in terms of like the to-do list in terms of um, how to get organized, identifying leaders, finding the technical assistance providers, um, and what they needed to do. And I think that um, being able to witness that, um, that kind of that spark um, and, and really hear people articulate why their community um, was so important to fight for um, and knowing it was gonna be an uphill battle was um, really 
um, inspirational um, for me as a, as a young on the ground uh, researcher at that moment in time. And um, it's, I've had the opportunity to go back to that park. Um, we've done some emergency park planning um, workshops. We actually, I think, held um, with um, the assistance of Vermont Emergency Management. Um, we actually did um, an emergency park plan and they were included in the statewide catastrophic exercise back in 2014. Um, I think we had a, a pretty epic potluck um, um, uh, celebration after that. Um, and just, yeah, really positive memories from that experience. Um, when things, you know, they were in a really difficult place um, at that moment in time, but they just really took it and ran with it with the support of, of course, um, many partners, but um, yeah, fighting for their community. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. I like the idea of an epic potluck. That's so uh, <laughs> that we can get there in our kind of community engagement. Um, Elise and Gail, any, any other thoughts on some of the, the opportunities in, in the mobile home communities in the state? Um, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of it is related to what Kelly already said about the community there and just like witnessing random acts of kindness, like that, you know, older woman who lives in that house and, you know, can't mow her lawn anymore and a neighbor just comes over and does it without being asked. Um, and, and the other, you know, kind of broader opportunities um, with the, just the workforce housing shortage that Vermont is facing right now. I'm just, you know, the people who live in the parks that are coming to mind, um, people on fixed incomes with, you know, rent skyrocketing and they can actually have a stable, more stable housing cost in a mobile home park, um, largely thanks to the statute that limits the annual increase in lot rents. Um, to people, um, woman who drives a school bus, a uh, gentleman who works as an IT consultant at a school in Colchester, um, like the jobs that Vermont can't fill because people can't afford to live here. Um, a lot of the folks who are doing those jobs are living in our mobile home parks. Yeah, that is definitely a really important piece. And, and Gail, I'll pass it to you too. So what I really noticed was in the beginning of COVID, and what I see as a, um, a co-op, and because we have committees and we have a board, I saw a camaraderie and I saw people step up where I don't know if they would have before. We're only three years old that we're a co-op. But there were people offering you know, rides to people or if they were frightened to go into the stores. We have a committee that pulled together some resources to be able to do that for people. So that's where I see the positive is that in the community, there is, you know, you always have those handful of, no, they're not going to join you know, or any or be involved at all. But for the most part, the majority of people are good neighbors and they have pride in their community and their homes. And when we're talking about the resources, you know, if all that you have generating to come in to pay your lot rent and your bills, and there's nothing left over to really maintain your home, that's how they get run down and people start to lose enthusiasm because there is no way, there's no options for them. But as a, you know, as a whole, I see it as people banding together to help each other. And that, it's, a, it's a great thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. the the pro, the community pride is is an important thing, and that and that is especially true in, in some of the co ops. Mm -hmm. um, but the point that you were kind of making before, or you know, right before that was was um, you, what's a good way to put it? Feeling feeling like uh, overwhelmed by the magnitude of of the issues that that a lot of homeowners feel. And, and this will kind of transition into the question that Anthony asked, and that is, you know, outside of infrastructure, what are some of the major challenges in, in these communities? And, and I can just start by, you know, putting together one point, and that is, you know, I started out by saying that there are 7,000 households uh, in mobile home parks throughout the state. The mobile home program, which is the main resident support organization, is currently three people. We have three people for the whole state from the Northeast Kingdom to Bennington. Um, and we're based in Burlington. So inherently we are fighting some, some pretty monumental odds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, we do what we can to, to make sure we're getting to all of these corners of the state. But in 2019, we had one person on the mobile home program. So, you know, 
the odds are against us to a degree, but but we do our best and, and we try and make sure that we're getting to all these parks and and really distilling down some of this really heady information that can be coming from so many different places of there's this grant and this grant and this grant and this grant, and this is your responsibility and this is the park owner's responsibility. Um, it's really challenging. I mean, it, the fact that, you know, we have jobs is a sign that the system is hard to understand. Um, so that is certainly one, you know, one additional challenge of just the level of support that exists, primarily for, you know, a, a demographic of, of older people who are, are in older homes that are aging, which, which I'm sure that'll come up as one of the challenges. So um, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just pass it back to the panel. A anybody would like to touch on some additional challenges of, of mobile home parks? So we have a, a hand raise from Chris. I know Chris is, uh, you know, from ACCT. I, I would, uh, you know, I'll, I'll defer to our panel first. And, and if anybody would, would like to. I cede my time to Chris. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Chris. Just to add on before I think we get into like the like really great specifics with Chris. Um, I just want to say like when we are, when I'm like talking with folks across the country about um, mobile home parks, we are so fortunate to actually know where our mobile home parks are and know who the owners are and know what the lot rents are um, because of the registry um, that Arthur Hamlin at the agency of commerce and community development um, manages and being able to track that data. Um, one of the things I often tell my students is we measure what matters. And so the fact that we um, have that data to work with and be able to track and know where folks are is a really, um, is a, a huge asset for us. Um, immediately after Irene, um, I remember some you know, being around some long-term recovery committee, um, you know, table meetings and basically, you know, we, at least we had the mobile home, um, park addresses and we knew how many parks and we knew how many households. Um, but when folks were asking about like rentals, um, and folks who are in, um, you know, rental units within the community that we don't have that, um, um, akin piece of, um, data set, that data set. Um, and so that was, you know, that was really illuminating and really for me in that moment really drove home like the importance of that, um, that registry that, you know, lives up on the ACCD um, website, um, but, um, but it really made a difference on the ground in that way. And then also being able to track um, the trends and, and what's happening right now. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give some big kudos to Arthur Hamlin at the DHCD. Um, he, he was unable to join today because he was feeling under the weather. But um, yeah, I mean, again, talking about capacity, it's the three of us as the resident support and one person in all of the state government for all of these mobile homes. So we're great that he's good, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I'll, I, Chris, Chris, I'll pass it over to you to uh, kind of touch on some of this stuff. Yeah, I think... You know, it, kind of answering Anthony's question, uh, you know, working in the mobile home parks and with the residents that we have, you know, I think the biggest um, obstacle that I see with a lot of our residents, as Elise mentioned, is we have a lot of residents that are on fixed incomes that are retired or um, are um, or are are the 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 working class where you know there's not a ton of money available to them. Um, and being able to upgrade a home that's from the 60s and 70s um, is just not realistic for them. Um, they can't afford the down payment. They can't afford the mortgage payment and lot rent. Um, so it's it's really challenging for a lot of our, I, I, I can, there's parks that have homes that were there when they started back in the 60s. Um, and I actually was just in one the other day. The lady called me into her home and said, I need you to come and see where I'm living. And I was like, okay. And I walked in and she's got Ziploc bags hanging from her ceiling, catching the water that's coming through her roof because she can't afford to fix it. And even if she did, she's like, my home is so old. It's from the 60s it's not, nobody will fix it because it's not worth what they're gonna put into it to fix it. But I have no other options. I can't afford $1,000 a month for a rent payment. So, you know, it's the challenge is, is, is the cost of upgrading a home or even making their home more energy efficient because nobody's certainly gonna put solar panels on, on a roof that's that old. Um, or, um, and, and make it for, uh, you know, more affordable for the resident to live there. Um, I think, you know, when, 
when um, we're talking about you know, residents finding financing, that's also another challenge is finding lenders that are gonna loan on mobile homes. I have a, a home that's for sale in Lindale today. I reached out to one of my approved applicants that I know would be able to afford to purchase this home and would be able to afford a mortgage payment and the lot rent and his bank will not loan on a mobile home. And this is the bank he's been dealing with. This gentleman's in his 60s. He's been dealing with this bank for 40 years and they won't they won't loan money on the on the home. Um so he's 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 totally dismissed going anywhere else to find somebody to to um to to fund it. But um so that would be the biggest I think issue that I see with our residents is um, just being able to afford to upgrade their homes um, and and finding the money. I know CDOAO has a lot of really good programs, but then you also run into those middle in class income people that are just over the income guidelines and don't qualify for anything um, and then can't afford to maintain their home. Uh, they're they're making their, you know, their payments, their vehicles, their home insurance, their, their health insurance, their daycare, all of those expenses, and they have no money left. Um, so that's where I see a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, but um, yeah, I, it's anybody else wanted to chime in. Yeah, I think I, I would like to echo just kind of some of what you were saying and, and looking at some of the numbers in, in the slide that Chris had up. Um, you know, when we talk about fixed income, these are very this is these are very common in terms of the mobile home landscape. And this can be someone that their whole entire monthly income will be a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars. And if you look at the sample budget, you know, just the cost of living might be eleven $1 hundred. To be left with a hundred dollars for a rainy day fund, should mm -hmm. you know your roof go or your water furnace or yeah. water heater blow, you're in a really tough spot. And mm -hmm. um yeah, a lot of these people have been Vermonters their whole life. They've been yeah. living in this community for so many years. They've been a homeowner and suddenly, you know, their home that they've been in is is more of a burden than, uh, yeah. you know, than they can really stand. And, and it's a really tough spot with without, um, you know, there are opportunities to buy new mobile homes and get some assistance yeah. with that. But again, a lot of these people that are on a fixed income can't take a one hundred thousand dollar, you know, mortgage out on a new home. It's just not viable. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're talking about somebody that has eight hundred dollars a month, and I mean the thousand dollars is awesome, but this particular woman that's got the, the baggies hanging from her ceiling, she her income is eight hundred dollars a month. That's yeah. what she has, and there is absolutely no way in the world she would be able to afford, even maybe a, purchasing a used home if she could find one. Um, you know, cause, and she doesn't own a vehicle, so she has no car payment. Um, and she needs to be within walking distance of things. So that eliminates a lot of our mobile home parks because they're not walking distance to a grocery store or a drug store or a bank or, you know, any of that. So, you know, it, it limits her ability of where she can live. Yeah. And, and Chris is only one person with a very big job. Um, what ACCT, I know we're out of time, but just what we're trying to do to move the needle on this, we started a family support program a year ago so that Chris at least has someone to refer somebody like this to so they can help them work through this really complex process. But we have one family support coordinator who also is serving our 334 apartment residents. Um, so, you know, that would be like a caseload of 750 for her. So we just like need way more resources. Like Nate was saying, you know, only three people to serve the state is, is not enough if we really want, um, you know, all of these wonderful programs that are out there through RD and the information that's out there on CVOEO's website. We actually want to increase take-ups beyond maybe like one person a year in a mobile home park and, and with ACCT is able to replace their home or do a home repair loan, um, we're going to have to invest in helping people access these programs is I think really what we need to do on that front. Yeah. And, and just looking at the time, um, I'll, I'll pass over to, to Gail for one other kind of thought. We are, we are a little bit past, but that's okay. It's been a great conversation. Um, and before I do, I just, I popped a, a document into the chat and that is 
um, a flyer for some additional upcoming uh, mobile home program work um, specifically for mobile home residents. So to kind of continue to continue reaching people and continue, um, you know, making sure that people know about the resources available, we're going to be doing a, um, we're calling it a statewide training with two opportunities for folks to join um, where they are able to kind of work, learn about the services that we offer, the financial assistance that's currently available. Um, and also to see that, you know, a lot of what we've talked about today, yes, there are situations in specific parks, but they are very generalizable. So, you know, showing that, you know, the problems you might be facing are, you know, the same as the park next door or the park three towns over, and maybe we can find some solutions collectively that work together. So um, that's kind of the goal of those two trainings. One of them is going to be on uh, Wednesday, May 4th, and the other is Saturday, May 7th. Um, and all participating mobile home households that do attend are going to get a $40 thank you gift card for attending. So we really are trying to get some, some good attendance there. Um, and, and we're going to really start marketing that next week. Um, thank you. So with that, I'll pass it over to Gail for any last words. And, and then Corinne will wrap us up after that. So the one thing that I looked at was that uh, that stigma about mobile homes and live it, living in a mobile home, it's there, it's present, it's alive and well. But the one thing that I noticed in the last couple of years is that uh, people such as yourself are not calling it mobile home parks. Oh no, she froze. Anymore, yeah. or trailer parks, you're referring to. And I think it's a step in the right direction. I think it's a baby step. But I think it makes all the difference because that trailer, trailer park, it's a, it affects anyone that lives and we and we hate it. So thank you, whoever has been using that. I see it a lot. And I just from me personally want to thank you. Yeah, Gail, you cut out when when the specific term you were you were using. Uh, so you wanted to say the better than worse than terms. I think mobile home community, I mean, we all refer to it as a park. It is a park, but when you start calling it, it's lessened that people are calling it trailer park. Yeah. And then it's kind of transitioned to mobile home park. And now I see um, MHC a lot for mobile home community. Those yeah. little things make a difference. They make yeah. a tremendous difference when you, when the conversation is toward everyone when you stop using a negative connotation, then that's how we make success and progress with it not being viewed that way anymore. Unless you put something on TV and you see that regular trailer park with the wife beater, but there's nothing you could do about that. There's got to be, you know, there's got to be some distinction. I'm just appreciative that people are looking at it differently or beginning to look at it differently. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Wow, what a what a great note to end on, Gail. Um, mobile home community, I love it. And I do have to quickly say before I close us out, thank you to our partners that have allowed us to uh, do this work. I'm hoping that I'm sharing the right screen at this point in time. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I will stop sharing. And thank you to our panelists. This was an amazing conversation. It truly brought some tears to my eyes in, in certain points. And I know we could have spoken for a whole other hour. And, um, you know, I'm really hoping that we can find some opportunities in the future to continue this conversation because um, obviously there's a lot there. And it just, um, we're just scraping the surface. Uh, with some of the topics we covered today. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Chris, honorary uh, panelists. And thank you, Nate, for um, facilitating this conversation today. Yeah, and this is my, my last plug. Um, any folks who may be a mobile home resident or know some mobile home residents, um, pass this on. Send me an email, nlanteri at cvoeo.org. What's our email address? Um, and uh, yeah, we can answer any questions so that folks can uh, get in that attendance.
And we will be sending follow up emails with all of the resources we, we covered today. So don't you worry if you were registered for this event, you'll be getting the information and panelists, if you have anything that you uh, want us to add, you know how to contact us. Thank you. All right, everyone go get that sunshine while while we have it. Thank you everyone. Is it sunny for out? I can't tell. I'm in a concrete box. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye everybody. Thank you everybody Thanks. for attending, panelists. This is great. Take care. Quick hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. How'd it go, Corinne?